Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, let me welcome you on the, this first section after the lunch. Uh, this section is about data, about moving data, storing data, and computing the, uh, big science data. Our first speaker is Mian Usman from Giant uh, Association. He is the uh, network um, uh, engineer uh, working in the net network evolution team, right? So he will tell us more about the uh, status and uh, uh, future of the network uh, network. Uh, so, sorry, John network. Right. Can you hear me? Yep. Hello. Good afternoon, all, uh, and I hope you've all had a good lunch and some coffee as well. Uh, as uh, Radovan mentioned, I'm Mian from Giant, and I'll uh, walk you through what we have done over the last few years uh, in terms of evolving our network infrastructure, and then what is ahead of us uh, that I call frontiers. So my colleague earlier this morning, Paul Rouse, covered a lot about Giant. Um, Giant is, we are an association, uh, it's a mem membership association. And I think all of you by now know it's 38 and members. Uh, the only thing I want to cover on this slide is the, the, the number of services that um, was covered by Paul. So we have network and connectivity services, we have security services, TNI services, cloud services. But in this presentation, I'm really only going to focus on the network uh, services itself. So here's a kind of a list of all the different projects that Giant has been involved in over the years. So as uh, m many of you may know, that Giant Association coordinates and runs uh, several of the EC-funded uh, projects. Some of the ones that I will cover are the uh, Giant 4.3N, for, um, which, was, which ended last year, December. Uh, it provided us about 50 million euro in funding to build out our fiber infrastructure. And then I'll also talk about the Giant 5.1, which is the project that started in January 2023. Uh, and it'll end um, end of this year. And there's a bit of a, um, uh, infrastructure investments in there as well. First, I'll kind of cover the foundation, the, the network infrastructure itself. So for us, the, the looking at the network infrastructure, the goal is very simple. We want to make sure that our network infrastructure is able to meet the needs of our users in a reliable and cost-effective way. So that's the goal that, that we have, and we investments and further enhancements that we do are all focused on that reliability and also on the cost-effectiveness. So first off, um, the challenge, right? I, I don't think this is just us challenge or giant challenge. This is the whole r &E community challenge, the traffic. Traffic continues to grow, demand continues to grow. But not just the traffic, the, the type of traffic is different as well. So here's the graph that shows you seven days of internet exchange traffic. As you can see, it's very predictable. There's a down and then there's a peak up and down. You can easily see what, when you're gonna have peaks and there isn't much change even on the six months graph as you can see, weekly graph. But when we look at the science traffic, picture looks very different and you, you can't really recognize any pattern, it's very bursty, and it's very unpredictable. And that is what we plan our network for. So we, we make sure that we have enough capacity in our network to support this type of traffic. We wanna be able to allow our users to send peaks of the traffic. So our, our network is not planned to support the averages, but the peaks. So that's why we kind of don't really like to use that word, but we do over-provision our network to be able to support this kind of bursty and unpredictable traffic. And I have a, a slide in, in later part of my presentation where I'll show how this over-provisioning has helped the, the users, big science users and HPC users to use our network. So I mentioned GN 43N and the 50 million euro investment. Um, that was the, under the project called GN 43N. Uh, this project uh, helped us kind of with the procuring new fiber and spectrum infrastructure. So I'm starting the infrastructure talk from the really bottom. So first the fiber, and then I'll go through the optical line system, and then the packet layer and the services. So this is the very bottom layer. And as the, the diagram shows, we've got now 32 
countries plus five with the Nordics connected on the fiber and the spectrum uh, connections. That means we have quite significant capacity available to connect these countries. And the other big thing is that we have long-term control over that infrastructure. What do I mean by long-term control? We have long-term contracts on these fiber and spectrum services. So we have uh, nearly 21 years of con contract on these fibers. So we don't have to go back to the market again and again. And we know that we will have these countries connected on fiber and spectrum for the next two decades. At the same time, also technologically, we've got a control over it because we know things aren't gonna change and we are going to buy or use the optical systems that are going to be there for at least another decade. And I'll just quickly show you what our fiber uh, and spectrum infrastructure looked like before. As you can see, it was very small. It was only connecting 14 countries. Um, and we had short-term fiber contracts. So what this new funding or new project has allowed us to do is expand our network, which now looks like this. And as you can see, it is quite significant growth. From 14 countries, we've gone to 32 countries. Not only that, we've managed to expand our network to the edges of, of Europe. And this is one area that was uh, our goal because we, we EC set us to kind of work on this so we can bridge that digital divide between the central European countries and, and the countries on the, uh, the edges of Europe. And another goal we had was to make sure that we are able to support um, 100 gig everywhere. So this project started for five years ago and at that time 100 gig everywhere was a big goal and I'm glad to say that we do support that and as you heard from Paul Rouse that even in, in, in Chestnut, uh, we have, they are now connected at two times um, 200 gig. Next up, from moving from the fiber up to the optical line system. So as I mentioned, we have fiber for 20 years, 21 years. We needed a line system that is flexible and reliable as well and that can run for long term as well. And we have deployed uh, Infinera Flex ILS and we think that will remain the basis of our network for at least another decade. So that underlying foundation of infrastructure that we've built will be there for decades. And this is, again, a, a quite a modular and state-of-the-art infra infrastructure. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about how we've disaggregated our line system in the next few slides. So moving from fiber to optics and then to packet layer. So that's where our, we deliver our IP services. We are now in the process of replacing our Juniper estate, which is an old state, with a new Nokia platform that we have recently procured. We procured it last year. Uh, the reason for uh, re-procuring that was the Juniper Estate, which we currently have, has been there for more than 12 years now. And in some areas, it has reached its maximum capacity of one terabit per second per slot. Now we're moving to Nokia, and that would support 18 terabits per second per slot. So quite significant amount of capacity on the fiber, on the optical layer, and on the packet layer as well. And another thing to mention here is that the Nokia hardware that we've bought is based on their latest chipset, FP5, which currently supports 400 gig interfaces already, and it can support 800 gigs as well as soon as the optics uh, become available once the specification is finalized and released. Uh, yeah, sorry, um, uh, this is the uh, packet layer renewal project. Um, I mentioned that we've uh, uh, procured Nokia, so we've started the deployment of this this year, and we'll be moving to these new Nokia devices or completing the migration by end of next year. And again, with the goal initially was to have 100 gig everywhere, now it's 400 gig everywhere, and this platform will support that. So a lot of capacity will be available. In terms of the, the network stack evolution, this is where what I wanted to, to talk about a little bit on the what changes we've done. So if you look at what we had a few years ago, it was just dark fiber and least capacity. Where we had dark fiber was in 14 countries and we had our own line system. But now we have dark fiber, commercial spectrum or spectrum from our NREN partners and least capacity. So what does spectrum do for us? In places where we don't see that we'll be able to utilize the fiber fully, even over the next two decades, uh, we don't see the need to invest a lot in that. And 
we then buy spectrum, which gives us a quarter of a fiber, 25% of the fiber capacity on that link in a cost-effective way. So again, when I mentioned early on that the objective for us is to deliver a reliable network in a cost-effective way. So this is one of the ways that we do that. So don't just buy fiber everywhere, but get spectrum as well in some locations where it, it makes sense. The second major shift that we've done is from the line system. As you can see, it was, a it was an aggregated line system from a single vendor. We had line system, transponder, and OTN switching. We've got rid of that, and now we have a disaggregated system with the DWDM line system by Infinera, and then another transponders by a different vendor. What that allows us to do is just buy best-in-breed transponders when, when they become available, again, uh, for efficiency and cost improvements as well. So I've talked about the foundation, and then as I mentioned, this fiber, the new optical system, and this, this new IP layer, it gives us quite significant amount of, of capacity as well. And we're moving from, um, from, from our user perspective, the user requirements are changing as well, from gigabits per second is going to terabits per second. With this infrastructure, we are able to support that as well. With users demanding not just the, the packets, moving the movement of packets, they, they need more than that with quantum key distribution, or precise time and frequency. And those are the areas where we are now headed and we see our users needing. So I'll very quickly share this slide. Um, this is from uh, last year, uh, 2021 rather, uh, two years ago. Uh, what this slide shows is the, the foundation that we have built, how we, our environs and our users are able to utilize that. So. Atlas experiment at CERN started using HPC node in Slovenia called Vega Euro HPC. And this is shown here in the light blue color. And as you can see, this does about 50% of all the jobs now done by Atlas. And what this needed, obviously the, the, the compute resources was available, but they couldn't use it unless there was network was available. And as you can see here, the network here, this is a graph from the Slovenian NREN the national network that connects to GN, it went up from 20 gigabits per second on average to over 50 gigabits per second almost overnight, and then eventually to 150 gigabits per second. But the infrastructure was there to support it. With the new infrastructure, we feel we are ready to support the needs of the Euro HPC and big science users. And this is just one example of that type of data that we can support. And again, it goes back to the philosophy I mentioned before that we don't plan the network for the averages, we plan the network for the peaks. And that's why we are able to support such traffic. Another um, thing I mentioned before is that NRINs and the users are moving away from just moving packets. They want more than that. So some, some of the examples are the non-data services. This is um, an example of a, a pilot we did last year. Uh, between CERN and a tier one in Italy, and they use a spectrum. So where we have our own fiber, they use portion of that fiber to send their data. And what that enables, us, enables them to do is use the capacity on the fiber as and when they need it in quite a cost-effective way because we are eliminating the needs of many interfaces. This has been live for a while now. Um, we see no technical issues in this. In fact, this spectrum was used in the high luminosity LHC data challenge earlier this year without any, any issues. And this service is now live in Giant as well in, in production. Another area, again, going to the non-data services. So some of the um, services, quantum queue distribution is is a key area that keeps coming up. Last summer, we worked with Toshiba and did a world's first trial of a twin field uh, quantum key distribution. Uh, this was run on a fiber that GN procured between Frankfurt and Kale. So that was EC funded fiber that we, you, you see there. Uh, and on the equipment that was developed by Toshiba with the OpenQKD funding, uh, what it did was the twin field protocol, it enables us to double the, the range of QKD. And this, again, as I mentioned, was a world's first trial, of first on the production 
kind of network environment. Um, Toshiba is currently working on a research paper. Once the peer-reviewed research paper is published, we'll be able to share more results of it. But the initial results were very positive, uh, and, and we'll share more in our articles or Connect magazine uh, when we are able to do so. Another big shift uh, in, in measuring in, in time, uh, that's the time and frequency network here. The science of measuring time metrology, there's a lot of big change. Uh, they need to redefine the second by 2030. And to, to be able to do that, they're gonna move away from cesium atomic clock to optical atomic clocks. And we are working with the community, the National Meteorological Institutes, to give them the infrastructure that they need. And the, the optical atomic clocks, as I understand, would be so precise that if you had got one at the start of a Big Bang, uh, so 13.8 billion years ago, and you had it running even till today, it'll only be out by one second uh, today. So that's how precise those clocks are. And we are working with that community to enable them to redefine that second um, and provide them that infrastructure. So if you look at it, what's missing here, this eastern part is not really connected with this western island, so these two are separate islands. And then you see these big four NMIs the, in London, uh, PTB, Paris, um, and, and Turin. They are not fully connected with a ring or a mesh. So this is what's missing, this is what that community needs, and this is what we are doing. We are actually over the next phase of the project, which will be GN52, we'll be procuring those red links. And this link here, uh, has Germany to Poland, has already been procured. We have signed the contract, and we'll be running a production pilot um, later this year. Uh, and then with the successful pilot, we'll be procuring these other links as well. At the same time, we are also making efforts to build the community for this so we can work with the community and MIs and the NRINs to develop this infrastructure further and extend this to other parts of Europe as well. So just very quickly summarizing, so we've got, I've shown you significant kind of investments in, in the infrastructure. In the first few slides I showed you uh, the number of different projects that we were involved in. So there's nearly 100 million euros of investment that's gone into building that, the infrastructure that I've shown you. What this, this gives us is a very strong foundation of long-term infrastructure. As I shared that the fibers are there for 20 years, the optical network will be there for at least 10 years, the new packet devices will be there for at least 10 years as well. So it's a, it's a quite long-term uh, and strong foundation that we have. I also showed you the, the fiber map, which extends to the edges of Europe. Again, it helps us bridge that digital divide and bring along all the other countries as well that lacked that infrastructure before. And because we have those, those long-term infrastructure, um, it helps us reduce the dependency on the market. We don't have to keep going back to the market to re-procure connectivity or the equipment. So this helps us focus on things, work with the community, just like the QKD trials, or time and frequency, or supporting the Euro HPC. Um, and all of this has been possible with strong collaboration with our partner NRINs, like the Cessnet, uh, getting their invaluable inputs using the CTO workshops and different forum. So we see that quite um, a, a good way to get a lot of input from our member NRINs and achieve what we have managed to achieve. And as I Say again, we are, we feel we are now better prepared to support the needs of EuroHPC and the big science users like LHC and the SKA. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions. So any questions in, in the room? So when we will see... Oh, sorry. Thanks for the nice presentation. I mean, you mentioned the 
when, when going to the really high speed and the fiber optic, you presented a few examples. And the, my question goes a little bit more conservative. Who are the major, I would say, bulk users or heavy users still using the standard IP packet moving, right. but requiring, again, the same capacity on going from 400 to 800 on the terabit scale? Who are they now, or who are those who you expect to, to happen when these things will be available? Yep. Very good question. Perhaps uh, for the next time, I'll include some of the slides there. So we see high energy physics users as the main user, LHC. Uh, they remain uh, the biggest user. I think over 40% of the traffic on the, the IP would, is from, from them. Uh, as they change to high luminosity LHC over the next few years, we see that trend continuing. But then we have other experiments that are coming up. The uh, square kilometer array, they, they, they have significant demands as well. So we see they will take some chunk. Then we have ITER, few others. But high energy physics in general is, is the big. But astronomy hopefully will catch up when the SKA becomes uh, live and operational. Thank you. Any other more questions? So thank you, Mian. All right, thank you. And now we will continue with a presentation from Jan Ruzička about the network updates uh, from or on behalf of Cessnet. Um, Good afternoon. Um, let's say that uh, lots of the assumptions and premises uh, said by Mian are also valid for our national um, national perspective. Uh, what should I mention is as a sort of an introduction. Uh, please keep in mind and discuss with us your plans, because uh, although we are we are preparing the network backbone as a sort of over provision, then when we need to reach your your site, your destination, sometimes it could take a month to prepare such link, uh, just because of the fiber fiber routes that should be procured or even built. Uh, we are not, not just a service provider. We are also carrying our own research and trying to develop the infrastructure. So that means that even in those uh, new areas, you could uh, talk to us and, and prepare the things together. Uh, to give you an overview how the how the network looks like, it's uh, kind of usual usual image with the usual cities. Uh, just the speeds are growing. Uh, we renamed the, the network to Cessna 3 after the last major upgrade du during the last year. So now we call it Cessna 3. Uh, what you can see is also our, are also the external, external links, uh, mainly coming from Prague and... Oh, it's not showing. Anyway. Sorry. Uh, mainly going down from, from Prague and from Brno. Uh, there you can see also the, the giant link, which is now two times 200, as was mentioned several times. Uh, links to the local uh, peering uh, system nix.cz, where it's also 200G. Uh, links to our, uh, our cross-border partners to uh, Austria, Slovakia and Poland, uh, which we also uh, upgraded quite recently. Those links are also expected to, to grow in the capacity in the following years. Uh, what's not that uh, what's not seen on the map is the situation uh, just around the Prague, where lots of infrastructures grow in the last years, and their their networking requirements also growing. Uh, so we moved to. Um, the better integration of those sites, and then build a new D, uh, DWDM system for those sites, so we are able to accompany their their requirements, starting at uh, 200G to each site with, with redundancy, but we can grow later to higher speeds as, as it is needed. We do it also because those sites are hosting parts of the infrastructure, mainly, mainly computational parts of the metacentrum 
and the storage, uh, storage systems uh, of the Infra CZ. Uh, those sites uh, are also equipped with, uh, with systems that are able to transfer not only IP uh, services but also non-IP. We plan to uh, we plan to build there also a time frequency uh, functionality uh, to be able to provide such services uh, for those infrastructures. Uh, what was already said by by me on the cap uh, the the speed and the, the 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 traffic is constantly growing. You can see it from uh, from Jean uh, compendium just the situation for the external traffic from, from Cessnet network. So we need to uh, encompany that into our, into our upgrades. Basically, the, the network is built uh, in three layers. The basic is the, is the, are the fibers, leased fibers. We don't own the fibers. But long-term lease, uh, same, similar to Giant, is our, is our approach currently. And then uh, on top of that, it's, it's a FlexGrid DWDM, uh, also a similar system to what Giant and other NRANs are using uh, to light the fibers and uh, fully utilize the capacity of the fiber, which could be uh, terabits, more terabits. <clears throat> then the IP layer, which is right now built around the 400G core, but uh, as the time will flow, we expect the 400G will slowly move to, towards the edge, towards the, the largest users, let's say. And we will gradually also grow in the core, probably to 800 or terabit speeds as they are coming into, into new systems. Uh, in aggregate, our, our external connectivity is something around 700 gigabits, which is now counting also the upgraded uh, Giant link, as, what, as it was mentioned. Uh, what we expect is upgrade to 400G or dual 400G around uh, 2026. It's uh, uh, because uh, the, the new Giant network will be, will be upgraded till the end of 2025, and then we expect also the new challenges coming from LHC uh, one in 2026. So we will we want to be prepared to uh, to satisfy uh, their attempts to transfer large large data. Uh, it's not just about the plain IP. Uh, we provide uh, some specific services to the to the sites and uh, groups. Mainly, we could say they are they are layer free VPNs or called, called uh, VRFs that could, uh, that could easily uh, build um, a dedicated overlay over the, over the network. So, as was mentioned, we are connected to Giant. We are connected in Prague and in Vienna, which gives us really a nice um, opportunity to to use the Giant, Giant backbone uh, with the new high capacity systems and we can grow further. As you can see, we are almost in the heart of the network. The um, Giant is not only the European um, thing, it helps us to reach uh, completely worldwide uh, research and educational network using the partners around the globe. And uh, this helps also, then it serves to our, to our user groups to reach uh, the systems, even in Australia, if you need, uh, using uh, the dedicated uh, lines, not the plain uh, ISP systems. Um, what was mentioned here uh, also several times there are a few users transporting really high amounts of data. The others are thinking of it. Uh, you can easily count that having 100G link, it would take you something like a day to transport one petabyte of data, but that's a bit of theory. Uh, you have to be really prepared, well 
well prepared for that. Uh, usually the network itself, I mean the, the core lines, are not uh, the limitation. Anytime you will hit any firewall, the speed will uh, drop dramatically. So uh, there is really a need to uh, discuss, consult and prepare if you are planning to uh, transport such a high amounts of data and you really need it to do it fast. You, if you don't care, you, you can transport it for a month, but there are several, uh, several issues then coming. Uh, so uh, that's why we are also using the term science DMZ, which actually is coming from, uh, from US. And it basically means that you should consider splitting your organizational network into, let's say, office part or uh, not so hungry part, and then the experimental part, and use separate lines to connect uh, to the backbone. Because you can use the direct connection into the um, core points of presence of the Cessnet networks uh, for the experimental part, where you actually usually know the, the opposite parts of the communication, you can then easily uh, build this L3 VPN and bypass or let's say overcome the limitations of the, of the firewalls that are usually needed for the office, uh, office systems. Uh, because anyone who's saying you, we have 10G firewalls usually doesn't mean or never does mean that you can, uh, you can send 10 gigabits through the firewall, or else you will have to pay a large amount of money. So anything above that, really try to find another way. Um, those, those VRFs, L3 VPNs, could be built without access to internet or with access to internet if needed. They could have a, uh, and defined, special defined, tailored defense mechanisms to limit what traffic and what amount of traffic should or could uh, could flow through the internet to to thus uh, to those dedicated systems. We already provide quite a lot of these uh, these VRFs, as you can see the probably. Major one is the LHC, which is international, not just our. And then there are several several examples, uh, either used by um, by Institute of Translation and Medicine in, in Olomouc to reach uh, the HPC systems in IT for Innovation in Ostrava, just have a sort of a tunnel through through the network, and directly interconnect those two. Uh, environments uh, without any uh, any other obstacles from from outer outer network. There are several more. It's it's used also for the interconnection of the hospital systems, which is called HSOC. So you can imagine that that really uh, not only scientific data is 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 flowing through such uh, through such overlay networks. And, and we are ready to build not just, let's say, point-to-point -point system, but really multi-point multi overlay, overlay systems. Uh, to um, show you what are some nice use cases also of the high bandwidth and low latency network is things that bring our colleagues with, uh, with um, let's say, multi-part um, so, culture performances where right here you can see two organists uh, in distant places playing together and and dancers locally and even remotely forming forming a, a new um, new performance uh, so you can imagine that that really the, the latency and the bandwidth that, could, that is needed for such uh, for such uh, transport is is uh, higher than, than the usual. The same goes to the assisted assisted surgery, 
this this is an image from from uh, cardio uh, surgery transmissions and uh, from the pictures so you can imagine you you can't use just the usual video conferencing system for such for such image because it's optimized for a normal meeting room not not for those dark blur strange images so to maintain the details you have to use a different systems that consumes much more bandwidth and expecting much much uh, better latency Uh, back again to LHC one. It's really the one of the one of the most hungry users of the network. As it was mentioned, the, there was a there was a data challenge, 2024, which is a preparation for for the start of the high luminosity experiments that will actually uh, impose a much larger. Uh, requirements on the network. So during these uh, two weeks, as you can see, this was transferred to, uh, in both ways, something like five petabytes of data. But here you can also can see that that that's uh, the limits of the of the links is just a part of the of the story. You really have to count and build and prepare storage systems that are able to uh, send and retrieve such amount of data in such high speeds. And the physics are preparing and doing that for several decades already, I think. Um, so so that's, that's a really uh, an illustration that uh, having, a, having a large link doesn't mean that you necessarily are able to transfer uh, high bandwidth data. Um, a bit step aside, um, I mentioned it or you saw it in the slides for a few times. Uh, we uh, have uh, systems that are able to defend the network, part of, of them uh, defending it automatically, uh, and uh, part of it is tailored specific to specific system of specific needs, and you can even tailor them specifically to some of these L3 VPNs or VRFs. Even users, or let's say power users from organization, can load their own uh, their own rules to protect their organizations or uh, systems into the core network, so they can easily easily limit unwanted traffic if they, if they need to, just before reaching their system, which is uh, very, very important, because if you limit the traffic before you, your system, it will not overload it, and it can still keep, uh, keep uh, enough power to, to deliver traffic uh, internally to other, other parts of your network. And another um, area is precise time distribution and synchronization. It was already mentioned by Mian. And the same, the same movement that goes around Europe is also uh, going in the, in the Czech Republic. And the usage of the, of the precise time synchronization uh, goes across several areas. Physics is just the usual stuff. Uh, going back to astronomy, going to uh, satellite systems or supporting the satellite systems uh, towards uh, 5G, 6G networks. Uh, it covers the, the cooperation of uh, national time laboratories uh, to compare their, their time sources. And it's even used internally in the networking to precise packet timestamping. If you really want to see what's happening in the network as the packets flow, you need to you need to synchronize the the network systems and and uh, timestamp the packets on a very very precise uh, a precise manner. Uh, why do we just why don't we just use the GPS? 
Well, because it's not precise enough, uh, and even if with, with special systems, you are limited to something like 30 nanoseconds. But as the current situations in, in eastern parts of Europe uh, showed, it, it could be easily jammed or spoofed. And then it actually poses the threat is how you can really rely on, on this system. So it's good to use another way how to support uh, this precise synchronization. And it could be done over, over optics, uh, relying on, on hardware that was originally built by CERN, but right now is, is built also by several, several um, companies. You already seen this map a few minutes ago uh, from Mian. Mian. It just sh shows that uh, the movement that goes in Czech Republic is also hand by hand, but what's happening in Europe. So we are connecting not only nationally, locally, but also inter internationally with, uh, with our partners uh, around Europe. What is the major major change that will come in in next year? Hopefully, that we will we will be able to offer wide rabbit signals in each major pop of the of the of the network that you can see here, including the Prague ring. And that's it. So. Any questions in the room? I have a question. Uh, when do you see that Cessnet will have one terabyte network or a need for? One terabyte? Well, if you want to do it for, for PR, we, we can build it almost tomorrow. But uh, I would expect 2027, 20, eight. It makes sense to have a sort of a terabit link, really. In the in the core, and will the applications will be ready for that? Well, if you take the the high energy physics, definitely yes. <laughs> okay. But anyway, as as Mian mentioned, we we could um, there should be more more applicants coming in in the next year. They will learn from high energy physics how to really transport the data, not just talking about it and then they will utilize it. Okay, do you have some online questions? No. So I have another question. Oh, there's more, uh, but first mine. Uh, what, the researchers should do, what the researcher should do when has some problem with the data movement of the data, for example, to HPC or somewhere else, what, what the researcher should do? Well, definitely uh, contact us, either, either via their support in, in the Meta Center or or storage storage group, or or directly when you're using the uh, the usual usual ticketing from from support assistant and CZ, and we should we should look into. It. Um, we would like to prepare in in following year some some measurement tools, so you can you can really uh, make some measurements from your systems and assume. Where are the limits of uh, of your setup? Okay, and one online question: White Rabbit has uh, open hardware specific. White Rabbit has uh, open hardware specification, and what is needed to participate in usage? Well, White Rabbit became something like a standard. Uh, we plan to uh, we plan to use a bit more advanced systems. Uh, something like it's used in, in the SKA, the systems that are capable of receiving the signals from several sources and having the usual uh, upgrades for the, let's say, enterprise level uh, grade service. But uh, from the user point of view, you just get your own white rabbit switch or white rabbit endpoint device and you will connect using uh, the fiber to uh, such hubs, let's say, switches, where, where you can receive the system and then you can incorporate it in, into yours. I think if there is anyone from uh, LI beams, they're already, uh, already using this approach. 
Okay, thank you very much. Big applause. Oh, one more question. I am sorry. So what volume of data would you ship physically rather than electronically or optically uh, over 1,000 kilometers within Europe? I would try to send everything over the network. <laughs> so well, 50 petabytes? Even petabytes, yeah. So thank you, Jan. Thank you. And now please welcome David Antosh, uh, head of uh, data storage department at Cessnet. We'll be following with the uh, uh, presentation about uh, handling scientific data uh, and storing data. Good afternoon. So far we've learned quite a lot about transferring data and now for something completely different, data storage. Uh, first, I will talk uh, about uh, generic data storage facilities we have in our infrastructure and you are probably used to using them. And, uh, well, it sounds boring. Uh, anyway, their role in the infrastructure is slightly shifting and changing and it needs to be described. And then I will introduce you to the concept of the National Repository Platform because it's a set of new services that is uh, under construction and there are quite big plans. Uh, so I will describe the architecture, state of development of this infrastructure and uh, all the plans about it. Well, first, uh, to clarify what is the scope of this presentation, I will describe the storage facilities that are available in the infrastructure as a, uh, as a system, as a, as a complex of, uh, of storage facilities. We have uh, storage systems that are tightly coupled with computational resources. Uh, these are uh, disk arrays in MetaCentrum. Uh, these are, for example, the project disk array in IT4i, and uh, also Scratch uh, uh, folders in MetaCentrum and IT4i. And those are typically understood as uh, part of uh, the computation environment, and this is out of scope of this presentation. So we got rid of it and uh, uh, what uh, this is actually about. We have some general purpose data storage facilities, uh, uh, also known as object storages uh, in, in current situation. And we have some special data services and also the uh, national repository platform I've already mentioned. Well, uh, let's start with uh, the general storage facilities we operate. We still have a hierarchical system with a tape library, which is uh, pain you know where. Uh, we have a disk array um, that um, uh, both of those systems are uh, about six or even more years old and they are going to be decommissioned. And we've completely replaced them with uh, a set of uh, storage clusters that are, that are named CL1 to CL5. Uh, that together have uh, about 121 petabytes of uh, physical capacity and we plan to keep uh, those uh, operating and uh, because uh, the oldest ones are getting a bit old and the disk uh, have some flight time, uh, we, planned, uh, we planned some renewals of them uh, which uh, will appear continuously throughout this, uh, the next and uh, the following year. And we will just uh, replace uh, the parts of the physical infrastructure and as opposed to our standard replacement of, uh, uh, of classical uh, hierarchical systems where we had a big movement of data assisted also by the users because uh, they, they got involved in that, uh, this, uh, this operation in, the, in uh, the object storage facilities should uh, ideally go completely unnoticed by the users because we just uh, replace uh, those rack by rack. Uh, those systems are built upon Ceph, uh, which is an object storage system. User interfaces for those um, are S3 and Terados block device if uh, somebody wishes to use so. And uh, it would be also possible to use uh, CephFS if absolutely necessary, but we will try to talk you out of that. Um, anyway, uh, 
Metacentrum and IT4I are still operating, are still planning to operate classical file system access because it's uh, what's uh, mostly used for uh, software that uh, performs any computations. Regarding other services of um, uh, our uh, department, um, uh, we also operate File Center, which is a, a service for transferring files uh, uh, temporarily uh, instead of uh, attaching them to, to MIDOS for files that are too, too big for that. Uh, we still have OnCloud, which is a sync and share service uh, that is able to synchronize data uh, among your devices and has a nice web interface. Uh, we uh, also uh, plan to continue uh, providing sync and share services, uh, which is uh, a bit unfortunate that we named our service by the product that is used uh, to, uh, to perform that, uh, because we are considering to switch to an alternative, just because some unfortunate uh, things that are currently happening to own cloud uh, company that uh, mostly develops the system. Uh, anyway, uh, sync and share service will be available. We might just switch uh, the implementation. And uh, this system is sustainable for, for conservative growth of the user community. It wouldn't be able to easily handle, uh, for example, tens of thousands of users uh, coming to the system at the same time. Well, uh, regarding our standard uh, object storage, the role of the systems need to shift a bit because uh, we used to identify, and you probably heard me say that more than once, more than twice, more than many times, that our many, main use cases are backups, archives, and uh, data sharing. We are faced with uh, new requirements for uh, scientific data retention, data fairness, and so on. And uh, we also have to define the role of the storage facilities uh, with respect to the national repository platform so that all of that makes sense. So how this is uh, currently shifting? We uh, have uh, data storage facilities for big scientific data. Uh, those can be used for uh, uh, computation tasks, uh, for data that is exceeding the size of standard disk arrays uh, uh, that are available in Metacentrum. For example, if you heard uh, Professor Haich uh, in the morning talking about uh, 1.7 petabytes of data they are processing, uh, those wouldn't fit uh, to, to any uh, other facility than this one. Uh, this, uh, uh, this storage, uh, this object storage uh, uh, can also serve for data that uh, make little sense to be put directly into into repositories uh, because uh, they will be, for example, heavily processed and heavily changed throughout the processing. And uh, they also make sense for data that need to be shared among users and uh, can be shared quite dynamically. And in addition to that, uh, while we are building the national repository platform, uh, to which we will get uh, in just a moment, uh, these uh, storage facilities with standard uh, object access will also serve as buffer for uh, users that uh, basically have archives uh, but uh, need to wait until the capacities of the National Repository Platform get ready. Uh, anyway, they should not end up as a final resting place for unstructured mess of data as it is currently quite often the case. Uh, well, everything I was describing is more or less an evolution, not a revolution. Uh, majority of data that is stored uh, on the facilities must be scientific. Uh, uh, we expect that the archival function will be taken over by repositories, and uh, uh, this is uh, more or less uh, in sync uh, uh, with uh, what is uh, understood uh, in the scientific community uh, more and more that uh, just files with no metadata uh, stored in folders uh, cannot uh, be considered an archive anymore. Uh, we uh, completely understand that the transition will take several years and uh, you will hear later in the afternoon 
uh, for example, about education programs uh, that uh, will be also prepared for user communities because education of users is the key here. Regarding backups as the standard, uh, as standard uh, uh, mode of use of these facilities, uh, uh, usage patterns must, must fit uh, reasonably into the infrastructure. For example, if uh, someone wants to use uh, those facilities for uh, temporarily storing uh, scientific measurements, it uh, might completely fit into the workflow and be uh, absolutely okay. And uh, I would say that uh, uh, the main advantage of uh, those uh, uh, storage systems is the ability to share data even between users from various organizations because it's uh, uh, based on our excellent AI tools that uh, we can do this very easily. Let's get uh, to the National Repository Platform. Uh, the National Repository Platform will be a platform to store data in repositories, no, not very surprising. Uh, it will be distributed, it will be mounted around, uh, and it will be a system for repository instantiation. I will start with describing the types of users we expect the data to have. One is a standard end user of a repository uh, who searches data, downloads the data, deposits the data into the repository, and those users are mostly not interested into the infrastructure itself. They just want to use a single repository or, or several of them. Then we have a repository administrator or data curator, however you want to call that. Uh, who needs a repository for a, part a particular scientific topic, for a scientific community or even for an institution, uh, which is a concept that is quite similar to a concept of a virtual organization administrator who also discusses with us, with the infrastructure, how uh, this uh, virtual organization should be configured and which resources uh, it should have access to. And it is completely the same with repositories, except that uh, to set up a repository is, uh, is a slightly bit more uh, complex than a single storage, uh, uh, storage slice. Uh, anyway, it should be noted that uh, there are no computational resources in the National Repository Platform. They are uh, obviously in the uh, e-infrastructure, but not in the platform itself. What is uh, a repository? Uh, it's a system for storing data with extensive descriptive metadata, which means that uh, you have uh, quite a lot of space to, to put, uh, put in a reasonable metadata describing your data sets so that the data can be found and uh, it could be understood what uh, actually the contents is. A repository has a web interface and API for machine access. It also brings uh, uh, responsibility for, for the data that is stored in it. Uh, it needs to curate the data and uh, uh, if you want to go into more detail, if you are thinking uh, you have a system and uh, uh, the question is whether this could be considered a repository, I would suggest uh, checking uh, Core Trust Seal certification. For example, uh, the link on the slide uh, goes to uh, Clarion repository uh, documentation for Core Trust Seal certification and this will give you uh, quite a good idea what the repository actually is. In short, it should contain citable data sets uh, and ensure that uh, they are fixed, they are immutable. And uh, on the other hand, it's not just an archive. It uh, uh, seems that the repository uh, should act as a final resting place of data. It's not the case. Actually, um, repository in a scientific workflow brings a question where you should store data into a repository. Uh, very short and very correct answer, it, it depends. Because you need to balance, uh, well, first you should store data uh, into a repository as soon as it is, it is possible, uh, when the data is fixed uh, and uh, uh, also when you have all metadata at hand that is necessary to, to compile a data set and uh, deposit it. 
On the other hand, you should not do that uh, sooner because if, uh, for example, you have a very large primary data set and you, uh, you have a very uh, small yield of data that is uh, produced out of that, it makes no economic sense to store the primary data set. Uh, well, storing data to, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, staging data to computations uh, from repository would not be much uh, more complicated than from standard object storage, and uh, we will uh, we will demonstrate tomorrow in uh, Milan Danicek's presentation uh, how this is done from uh, from standard object storage. And it should be also noted that if you put uh, some data set into a repository, it doesn't automatically mean that uh, this data set is published. It depends completely on you. Publication of data and controlling access to the data is always under user's control. We will have three implementations of repositories in the National Repository Platform. Uh, one of them is uh, Cessna's version of Invenio, which is the same system uh, that is used, for example, for Zenodo, developed by CERN. Uh, Charles University provides uh, Clarin DSpace, which is their fork of DSpace. Uh, the Academy of Sciences provides a system called ASAP uh, ARL, which is a system probably known mostly to people from, from the Academy of Sciences. And other implementation uh, is also possible. We have some piloted in the project, actually. And uh, the basic assumption is that alternative implementation of repository system must be basically a repository in the sense I've talked about uh, earlier. For example, it should be more or less certifiable to a uh, core trust seal. And, um, uh, the infrastructure will offer uh, S3 uh, storage and Kubernetes containerization as a service to uh, groups, uh, groups that want to uh, operate something like that. So, uh, the national data infrastructure will be composed of the following. We will have the national repository platform. Uh, its uh, expected capacity in five years' time should be something like 250 petabytes uh, physical capacity, which uh, translates to something about uh, uh, 50 petabytes of user capacity, which is mostly due to uh, the fact that we consider a replication of the data to three geographical locations to be a reasonable start. We will have a, a national metadata directory, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, called uh, national metadata addressage, address book in Czech. Uh, don't blame me, I didn't ask to sell this stuff. Uh, it's only a job. Uh, it will be a metadata aggregator. Uh, it will have uh, search capabilities for users. If a user has no idea where a data set uh, actually is, uh, this would be the starting point to, uh, to search from. We will have a national repository catalog, which, would be, uh, which will be a list of available repositories, uh, including uh, probably metadata schemas. And we will have uh, generic storage facilities I was talking about and all the supporting systems. What is available right now? Uh, we have a catch-all data repository uh, running as data narodni pomočka repozitar.cz, which is a terrible way to say it in English, uh, for long-tail data uh, and uh, also for groups that uh, uh, are considering to uh, have uh, their dedicated repository and don't have one yet. Uh, there is uh, just a small uh, storage capacity so far, but we will transfer uh, this system to use uh, our current uh, storage facilities, and we are in the process of procuring hardware for the infrastructure, so uh, this should improve dramatically in the near future. Uh, we have uh, several repositories uh, in various systems and various implementations as instances of uh, the National Repository Platform that are currently appearing. And uh, as I was talking about the National Metadata Directory, tag, uh, so nma.eosq.cz is uh, where it's, uh, it's currently running. 
it's running and is harvesting uh, metadata from several repositories that are available, uh, available now, and we will transfer it to uh, hardware that we uh, recently procured. Mail, uh, main milestones for the National Repository Platform. Uh, we will uh, have installation of S3 and Kubernetes to run repositories uh, uh, in the middle of the next year. And uh, by the end of next year, we will provide uh, um, basically a repository as a service. As a service. Uh, and first dedicated hardware resources from the, for the National Repository Platform will be uh, available uh, before half of the next year. We will much move the catch all repository there and other repositories as well. We should also reach uh, the number of three geographic locations uh, by the end of uh, uh, 2025, uh, as this is a part of quite a big project that also contains a lot of development, and you will hear about this uh, uh, from uh, Professor Matiska later this afternoon. We will also have quite a lot of work continuously integrating the results of the project into the infrastructure. And we will reach its full capacity and uh, complete functionality that is currently planned in 2028. Uh, so, where to see documentation and support? Uh, regarding standard storage uh, services, uh, the contacts are as usual. Uh, regarding the National Repository Platform, you can use the storage ones, it's completely okay, it's mostly the same group of people. Anyway, if you, uh, uh, should be, uh, if you want to be uh, systematic uh, about this, you can uh, check the uh, National Repository website. There is a di direct link to documentation on the main, main page and there is also a special link for support. And uh, you can also uh, register into the uh, national repository, which is again a actual repository with a generic metadata model. Uh, anyway, you can get a DOI identifier for your data sets. Uh, it's just currently quite limited in capacity for mostly for technical reasons. So, to sum up, the role of generic storage facilities in the infrastructure is shifting uh, with more emphasis on working with scientific data. Uh, archival functionality will be uh, taken over by the National Repository Platform. Uh, we, uh, regarding the uh, standard storage facilities, we um, need to tie, couple them more tightly with uh, data processing. And the National Repository Platform will be one of the pillars of the national data infrastructure, basically supporting the new needs of uh, scientific communities. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you. So, um, let me have one question uh, to all of you. Who is starting already building repositories or is uh, doing already uh, storing that in repositories at this moment? Please raise it up. Few. One, two, three. Okay. You so, will. <laughs> soon. Wait for it. Coming soon into uh, research. Uh, so we have one online question, which is uh, what processes is employed in order to securely dispose uh, storage devices when they are decommissioned? Decommission Once again. Uh, what happens after you, uh, we decommission this uh, storage facility? Uh, they get crushed. That's easy. They get crushed physically. Uh, the disk, uh, disks uh, get uh, physically crushed, the tapes get physically crushed, and uh, uh, where, when we are dealing with, uh, with object storage, it makes more or less no sense because uh, the data is encrypted uh, on the physical medium anyway, so it uh, doesn't actually matter. But it's not uh, that uh, more expensive to, to decommission the device, including physical, uh, physical destruction of, the, uh, of disks and tapes. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Yes?
Yeah, uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, you mentioned several things, and uh, I wonder first, you re mentioned the replacement of own cloud. If you have something particular in mind, like next cloud or something even much more different. Uh, probably next cloud. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned that Metacentrum is using that traditional file system. Uh, and I wonder when you use hierarchical storage uh, f f when accessing from Metacentrum, what does change from user's perspective? Because I would expect some like transparent access uh, to top to player and uh, just directly access it as uh, nowadays. Well, hierarchical storages. Uh, if you are talking disk only hierarchical storages, we had some experience, for example, with uh, uh, with uh, mate arrays that switch off some disk uh, disks. It uh, used to be quite a hype, uh, let's say eight years ago, and uh, from my perspective, it's mostly pointless. And I believe that this technology is mostly abandoned by by uh, vendors and so on. Regarding tapes, uh, well, uh, tapes are great if you have uh, quite a lot of data that is wrote once uh, and read uh, more or less never, or read uh, in the same order that it was written. Because if you have uh, such a dynamic system as ours and you you constantly uh, delete files and update files and so on uh, the the data gets uh, as much scattered throughout the, the the tapes that it is uh, quite difficult to retrieve them and in addition to that uh, it turns out that uh, tape libraries uh, have uh, uh, more or less uh, lifespan uh, uh, precisely uh, precisely covered by their vendor's guarantee, and uh, then it costs quite a lot of money to keep them in operation. Happy? Ma <laughs> I, don't know whether, I don't know whether happy, but... <laughs> with the answer, at least, not, not, not with tapes. Okay, one more question. Is the data encrypted and stored, probably? Uh, well, uh, as I said, uh, the data is uh, encrypted to be stored on disks uh, in case of object storages, because it's the easiest way to ensure that you have no trouble, for example, for the vendor to replace disks that fail. Uh, and uh, to be honest, uh, uh, the data in the object storage is, uh, is uh, stored is in such a complex way that uh, I would wish quite a lot of luck to anybody who, uh, who wanted to reconstruct something uh, having just a single disk from such a facility. It's next to impossible. Anyway, it's, uh, it's encrypted there. So, more questions? No? So... Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, now we will be following with the two presentations about computing services. First is uh, Mira Gruda about Metacentrum and grid and cloud services in, in InfraCZ. <laughs> So good afternoon. Similarly to David, I'm positioned when I should show you or present what Metacentrum is doing. And I've seen a lot of people who are using Metacentrum for more than 10 years. And on the opposite side, there are newcomers. So my presentation will be somehow a mixture of what Metacentrum is, what we are doing, and some news. So hopefully everyone will get something new to, to, to come to, to, to bring home. Fortunately, we, we have a next day more technical people, more technical presentations about a lot of parts which we are covering. So I'm also standing here as a teaser for tomorrow on several present or several slides. I will just say you, if you are more interested in more details, please come tomorrow. So what is Metacentrum? Metacentrum is National Distributed Computing Environment. Which, is covered, which covers clusters split it across the Czech Republic, and we create something called grid. You can imagine this as one virtual cluster. Users should not 
know whether computation is running in one city or another city, one cluster or another cluster. If, if they don't care, they don't need to care. The environment is the same maintained as one virtual cluster. The idea is pretty old. Uh, if Erwin is still here, it's a great idea of 20, 30 years ago. Still working as a basic idea when if you have a, several clusters ac across Czech Republic, usually some groups are more heavily using it in one time, second, second group is using it in the second time. And if there is overload by users, there is something called Metacentrum which provides the glue, uh, another, store, another capacity which creates the glue and the Metacentrum itself still works. And we provide three types of computation models and I will be speaking about it, about it. Uh, later, similarly as a, as a uh, pair presented great cloud and uh, Kubernetes uh, containers. The same idea is still working even for other use cases. Usually we, 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 are, we are speaking about the integration of clusters of other partners. If you, you can imagine easily if we have uh, seven clusters across the Czech Republic, it's for, it's, it's for us re na nature to, to add aids, which is not owned by us, but just maintained by us. The same setup works for use cases where, you, where users are producing big data, wants to, wants to them to compute them as closely as possible. They can find the nearest cluster across the Republic and, and transfer data only there and so on. And the architecture, as you will see, architecture is reasonably compatible with uh, national data infrastructure just presented because, again, we have a clusters which are near to the repositories David, David was speaking about. And also Metacentrum is uh, somehow umbrella of new development for services for, of services for, for scientific computing. All the, you have, we have seen, again, the presentations by, by pair on demand. Uh, Jupiter and Kubernetes, this is what all we cover too. Uh, a lot of our development is done in collaboration with uh, scientific groups and scientific research infrastructures in, in current terminology. Uh, as I said, we started with high energy physics, currently also astrophysics, the CERN, HEP, you have, you have heard, uh, they are still big users in some, some parts. In uh, Metacentrum, most of the users are coming from the life science part. Um, I will mention several times Elixir, similarly to Per. Uh, technical part of Elixir research infrastructure is, is maintained by, by infra partners. We have a collaborations with a lot of uh, other research infrastructures in Czech Republic. In several cases which are uh, written Showing, yeah, in, in, in this line, it's surprisingly mostly on international level. We as a partners, we are, we are partners in EGI, European Grid Infrastructure, and then there, there is connection between the EGI and, for, for example, uh, Lindat or Eli better than on national level, but still there, are, there is some collaboration, and of course users from these national infrastructures are computing on our on, in our Meta Centrum, but we don't recognize them as a visible partners from, from research infrastructure. And I should mention uh, that we also maintain data from Copernicus uh, satellites, what, what ESA is providing. We are the partner for Czech Republic. We are partner which distributes data, uh, this data across Europe and so on. So again, if you are looking for using this data, we have, we have them stored very near to some clusters and you can, you can easily use them directly. So to the computing models, as I said, the, the oldest one and still biggest one is grid. You can imagine it as a, as a long batch jobs which are running for hours, days, weeks. We have, long, we have queues which, which allows monthly jobs and so on. So this, this is how, how long these jobs are. But of course, this is, this is what we are doing for 20 years. We understand that a lot of usage is currently pushing for some, some support for interactive tasks. So I will be speaking about, about 
Galaxy Jupyter or On Demand as a tools, interfaces which can be used for interactive jobs and interactive computing, supported also on, on this, this grid department, or the grid, grid part. As David said, we, we still use uh, file systems and we don't, any, we don't have any reason to, to uh, move away from file systems. We also support the containers in HPC way, that means singularity. I will have a few more details later, but I just to ha have to mention, mention also here. So, for example, all uh, packages which are provided by NVIDIA, including TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on, are available in our in infrastructure as a singularity containers and can be used immediately. And so, so you don't need to bundle TensorFlow, compile TensorFlow directly. The second uh, use case is virtual machine instead of task. As I said, the one, one way how you are using resources are, is prepare something task, which, which is somehow bash, bash script, which then starts some executable, which is running for days. The, this one, it means that instead of tasks, you are submitting something you can imagine as a complete virtual machine. Copy of your laptop, copy of your desktop, copy of your server, just running on our resources. And you can do whatever you are doing with your own computer. Completely, you, you are complete administrator of this. You, you are, it's, it's up to you what, what's installed there, how you maintain the software installed there, and so on. This is my story working some, somewhere for someone, but well, it's hard to imagine that everyone from you is able to create and maintain virtual machine and maintain the software installed there. So we don't expect that everyone from you will really provide a, a copy of virtual machines or provide the image of virtual machines. Those images are di mostly coming from scientific groups which together created one curated virtual machines, which is then deployed on our infrastructure, maintained by someone, one, one, someone who knows what to do and so on. So don't be afraid that you, you are expected to, to maintain the virtual machines. And of course, you can run more than one virtual machine, then it becomes even more complicated. So we provide some tools like uh, this way. Terraform or EGI Infrastructure Manager, which allows you to maintain virtual clusters on top of OpenStack. For at least five years, we had uh, just one installation, uh, which was built by Cessnet and Ceres together, sitting in, in Brno. We just, we, we, uh, in the previous year, we started on something which we called new OpenStack distribution, Beskar Cloud, I will mention it once again later and probably also tomorrow. So we are able to deploy OpenStack more quickly. We tried to, or proved that it works by installation, uh, second OpenStack distribution or OpenStack installation in IT4i last year. Currently we are migrating to this setup also in, in Brno. And the second, the third, use case is again change that you don't want to run complete virtual machine. Complete virtual machine means that you have an operating system there, your kernel, all libraries of operating systems and so on. Uh, if you want just one software package to be, to be somehow packaged, containerized, you are using, you, 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 you will know names, Docker, or singularity, which allows you just bundle the software you care and all necessary libraries which are used by this software, but nothing else. No daemon running there, no operating system around and so on. So this is, this is what container is. And again, you, can, you, can want, you, you, you want to run your computation inside the container or run a, lo a lot of containers and to create some virtual environment which you are using. This approach is also very useful for uh, things like reproducibility. You can imagine that the, this container can be used by you or your group for long term, then can be stored in a repository. And later, if you, if you want to return back after a few years and to prove that you, do, you did computations right, you will just restore the container 
not retrieve the container, not restore, but really retrieve the, the image of the container and you can run the computation again. All the necessary libraries should be there, so you should be able to reproduce what, what you did five years ago. We have a support in HPC for single containers started in HPC environment. This is what, what we, uh, we are using the singularity for. Sorry, guys. Can you, <laughs> can you, can you make it? Thanks. So this is, this is what we are using, where, where we are using. Uh, it's not moving to next slide, but yeah. And going back. I'm not able to go back. Yeah, I'm too too far. Even even more, even more, even more. Oh, I've I've lost my 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 story. <laughs> so we are, so so we we support the singularity and we support Kubernetes installations for if if you want to run microservices, managing all complete virtual environments and so on. Uh, yet another GUI is used for this environment, so so you will see several several times mentions mention range range of GUI. And we, of course, works on something which is then somehow converging these architectures, because if you have a three, three different models, you want to, okay, you start thinking whether you want, you want somehow merge them at least to two or finally one. So we, we are discussing the possibilities how to merge at least the, the HPC, HPC and Kubernetes part, which will be, which will be then uh, we will have a possibility to run it uh, on one one hardware overload and over, overlap and so on. The same environment is used for some service which we call sensitive cloud, and again we will be speaking about it tomorrow. So please come to tomorrow if you want uh, hear more. It's environment which allows you to to store and analyze medical data, sensitive data, so it's more closed. We, we make sure that the data are, are not leaked, are not leaking uh, away and so on. Huh? More details tomorrow, it's just saying this, these tools, uh, this, this Kubernetes platform is currently used for, for this. I was told that I should have uh, some pictures, so this is what we currently are really maintaining. This is which clusters or services we have and where right, this is in Czech Republic. These are real HPC, HTC clusters, which, which we have. Uh, and even here, you can see that in some sites like Liberate, these clusters are not provided by us, but by our partners. We have uh, one cluster which is dedicated to WLCG, uh, CERN usage, and so on. So we have a uh, uh, what, what this, this cluster is provided by Institute of Physics of Academy of Science. Then there are the cloud installations, Brno and Ostrava. We have also a virtualized platform which is used to, to run services which must be really run in high availability mode. So we make sure that we have two copies. One is running in Brno, one in Prague, and even if one city goes down, we still are able to provide web service for your, your computing service or something like this. These are clusters which are provided or resources are provided by Elixir, but we are maintaining it. We as a Cessnet and Serit together, they are integrated to infra using the same AI, the same batch system and so on. As a partner of infra CZ, we have a nice collaboration with supercomputing centers. So even this smaller one, you will see that it's not small one as the next presentation. And these are objects and data repositories David was speaking about. So Violet is what currently is our object storage is David was speaking about. And Pink are instances of national repositories which are expected to be on this location. So again, back to the complete picture, this is what we are maintained, uh, how close are those installations and so on. So some numbers, 
what we currently have is, is nearly 50,000 CPU cores, uh, nearly 500 GPU cards. What, what is interested is uh, more than 3,000 3, 3, of users. I, you, I will show you the next slide just to remember, remember the number. And then uh, you should not be surprised. We have a small, we have majority is a small cost, small nodes, means two CPUs, less than one terabyte of memory, some servers which are, which are with larger nodes, and again, what, we have a few installations which are much, much bigger. So we have a two servers which are six or 10 terabytes of, of, of RAM. Similarly, on GPUs, we have any kind of GPU you can find for the last 10 years, including latest H100, but we have also pretty old ones, if you are interested about, it, about these versions. And once again, last year we installed the, the biggest or newest machine, NVIDIA DGX2, with eight H100 GPU cards. If you want to understand how much or how is the usage split it across the use, these, these use cases or types of computations I explained. You can, you can either use CPU numbers, so from those nearly 50,000, 50, nearly 80, uh, nearly 40,000 are going to the grid. This one, this one is national one, and this, this part is uh, what, what's provided for, for a WLCG uh, the HEP community cloud and Kubernetes cloud. The same in CPU usage, CPU years means every, every year the CPU was computing something. Uh, this is not a mistake. All numbers we are using are without hyperthreading. This usage is with hyperthreading. That's because it's twice more. And as, as I said several times, several groups are providing resources to the Metacentrum. Of course, the basics are what, what we are doing in, inside the infra projects, so Cessnet, Cessnet and Cerit. There is more than 5,000 5, provided by Elixir, more than 5,000 provided by Institute of Physics for WSCG, and the rest is provided by smaller installations by several universities or Institute of Academy Science. The same number in 10 years. Again, what you, you can see reasonable growth in any number you, you can find. What's interesting here is that from those 3,000 people, so users which we currently have, nearly eight, more than 800 are newcomers. That's because a lot of our users are PhD students or postdocs, which are working for some several years and then leaving PhD studies, finishing PhD studying, leaving their postdocs and so on. So we should onboard 800 people every year. This is number you should, you should remember. Because this is something what we would like to, to work on uh, later in the in new project. Here are some results which you can read and you will see again a lot of details tomorrow but what what's what I would like to spend at least a few months few minutes is is here we have a few ideas we have two and only one is visible here we have two ideas one is that we would like to train some people as a, something which we called campus champion or ambassador for large group you can imagine that we will train one person which is sitting inside of Eli, for example, who will be using the Meta Centrum, who, who will get any information we have, who will, who will get any training we can provide, and then he can serve as our ambassador for this group. This is something which is used mostly in the US in exceed infrastructure, and we plan more or less uh, copy this one. And we have a second idea which is not not here for some some reason Ment mentor for small groups we plan to train our people probably just one but have a one person who will serve as a mentor for newcomers and you can imagine that if new group will come will become members or will start discussing with Mata Centrum how to use how to use us 
we will provide this person for one or two weeks to show them, to, to give them all necessary information, to work with them, to convert their computations to the metacentrum infrastructure, help them decide whether they want great cloud, Kubernetes, and so on. And after two weeks, this person can skip to the, another group and so on. Second idea we would like to have uh, is something which we call medium-sized projects. Because you can, as you probably know, in Metacentrum, everyone from university or academy of science can get access freely, immediately, and can start computing. On the opposite side, in IT4I, we, we have a three rounds per year of call for projects, and they, they, they do scientific review and so on. We are looking for something in between, which will be somehow mid-sized projects, which can be, will be smaller in capacity we provide, but also will be more lightweight in evaluation. You can imagine situations where we don't do any evaluation because we know that your project was already successfully evaluated by technical, technical grant agency or grant agency of EU or something. So we don't need to do review again. And for this, we will also need something which we call medium-sized clusters. This is just terminology. It will be larger clusters in terms of Metacentrum, but small cluster in terms of ID4I. So it's medium-sized, somewhere between current clusters in Metacentrum and current, current big installations in ID4I. Again, used to support such medium-sized projects. I can skip this one. I already said a few words about the Beskar cloud installations. So we, we are currently in the position that we are migrating all virtual machines in Brno to the second installation. And uh, we are ready to help you if you want to have uh, your own OpenStack installa open installation. And if you, you want to have uh, integrated in the Metacentrum, we are currently finally in the position that we can provide this, this feature. And we have uh, some plans for some more advanced HPC installations for next years. Similarly, in Kubernetes world, we have a, something running in production from last year. Current, currently, we improved usage of availability of GPU clusters in this one. As I said, it's already certified for, for sensitive cloud usage, so we have a ni nice proof how we behave or how, how we expect that, it, that the, this environment is, is working. And we have some ideas, again, based on this large installation in Brno with parallel scratch file system. I've said a few words about the graphical interfaces, and we will be speaking about it tomorrow in one presentation dedicated to this one. So just, just to, to, to tell you that we have a on-demand which, is, which was again mentioned by Per as a standard interface for, for HPC world, so, so it's standard even for us. We provide Galaxy interface. We are, we are partners which provide Use Galaxy CZ installation. And if, if you are familiar with Use Galaxy EU, Use Galaxy Org, we have a more or less copy and we cooperate in, in this network of Use Galaxies across, across the world. And we support Jupyter Notebooks, locally in EGI installations, and we, we were able to, to, to win the tender for uh, Jupyter Notebook service in EOSC node provided by European Union. And the last slide is just because we are here as a infra conference, so yeah, we are working on integration infra. For us, it's, it's easy because the only part which, which was not integrated was is IT4I. So here are just few few items with what was already done last year. AI. So so we have a really just one account across all these all these computing and storing storage environments. Currently, we are working on documentation and. I should mention, I, fini I should finish it, yet we, have, we, are, we thanks to all who responded to our questionnaire of satisfaction with computing services, which again are done together. And that's it.
So I have one question, and that is for the audience. Who would like to become a Compute Champion Ambassador? And please raise your hand. I see one hand over there, one hand, a few hands on the, on the right. Two hands are enough. It, it is for us at least one or two years, because we don't really expect that we will train more than one or two persons per year. So then please contact Mirek and uh, discuss more with him. Uh, we have no online questions, so let me uh, thank you. Oh, sorry. I have a question. I've seen uh, quite a lot of GPU, which you have in, in Metacentrum. So do you have any statistics how often or how many users are using this facilities? Yeah, I, I didn't mention it. I, I even didn't made a link to this. We have a statistics available online for last year, and we have a statistics which, which can show you how well are GPU nodes used, how well are CPU nodes used, who is not, not the person who is using the most, most of the GPUs, but from which institutes are they coming and so on. Uh, do you plan to install a new software module, for example, for uh, software R? Great question. We have a I, I s mentioned somewhere, and again, we will have a full presentation tomorrow, but we, we, we switched to the SPAC installation of, of two software packages, which allows us, currently we have a more than 5,000 of software packages pre-installed by us, and we install, I was told, more than two every week. And, the, and besides this one, we support Singularity images, so anything which is pre-installed in Singularity, just download the Singularity image and run it. And uh, we support usage of Con Conda, or preferably Mamba. So, so if, you, if, you, if your software package is bundled in Conda or Mamba, you can use it again without any help of, from our side. So, thank you. Uh, we already are kind of lack of the time, so thank you. Um, for more questions, please see Mirek during the coffee break. Uh, next speaker is Vid Wondrak, the director of IT for Innovation, who will say more about supercomputing services and infrastructures uh, and plans. Okay, I, I got the instruction how to move <laughs> only forward in my presentation, so. Uh, <clears throat> Welcome you here and uh, in the afternoon session my talk is last one I tried to not to steal your uh, coffee break time so uh, I'll try to be fast. Uh, so uh, I would like to talk about the supercomputing services which are uh, provided in fact exclusively by IT for Innovation National Supercomputing Center at VSB Technical University of Ostrava as a part of e uh, infra, infra services and um, I will talk about the uh, Firstly, about operation and provisioning of the, of the superior com computing and data resources uh, for the national scientific community, which are exclusively provided, or exclusively mainly provided as open access through, it was already mentioned in the previous talk, through the, uh, through the open calls for the projects, which are open typically as three times per year, evaluated, and the decision is made by the allocation uh, panel. But we are also opening uh, specific calls, uh, either they are the social, for social and economic needs, for example, cooperation with industry, uh, cooperation with the state authority uh, for education, etc., etc. Um, then, of course, we are also playing the role of the national node of the European infrastructures uh, in HPC data, or any other type of the associations, institutions, and so on. The, the, the very important one is the Euro HPC joint undertaking because we are providing the, for, for, this, uh, for this joint undertaking, we are providing the petascale system. I will talk about it. We are also a member of the pre exascale system. Uh, uh, I think that you saw the presentation of the LUMI. Uh, we are also national, um, uh, national center of competence in HPC of the EuroHPC. We are also a member, for example, of the Partnership of Advanced Computing Europe, EU that collaborative infrastructure, ETP for uh, uh, HPC, IROTS, EOSG Association, etc., etc. And what we think is very, very important, and uh, we are trying really to, uh, to provide a really good training and educational services. I think that we are uh, recognized as the one of the very important European uh, training center for HPC uh, 
uh, and so on. And of course, the user support, this is the, uh, this is the really uh, important part. And it includes the uh, support from the level one, even to level three, or what we call the application level support. Okay, so uh, still Carolina Supercomputer, super this is our flagship supercomputing facility. Uh, Carolina is in operation already from uh, 2021, so it means uh, three years. Uh, and I would like to remind that the Carolina Supercomputer is the Euro HPC petascale supercomputing, so it means that uh, Carolina was uh, funded 65% uh, from our national resources and 35% from the EU funding via the Euro HPC joint undertaking. The total investment was 15 million euros, and uh, if you look so, uh, so far, we, uh, the Carolina provided the resources to 1,700 users, uh, not only from the Czech Republic, but also from overall Europe, and, uh, which, uh, and, and uh, those users used the, the, the Carolina within the 700 projects approximately. Uh, so expected end of the operation is 2026, so it means that the, the Carolinas right, uh, right now some something like the midlife. Um, uh, but this is just only for the Euro HPC users, so this is the contract uh, we had with the Euro HPC, so dependent on the, on the condition of Carolina, Carolina and, uh, and the potential successor of the Carolina uh, when uh, will be installed and so on, then potentially we can, we can uh, operate the Carolina even more, uh, longer. So Carolina uh, has a modular system. Carolina contains a non-accelerated node, accelerated node, data analytic nodes, uh, cloud part, and it's uh, linked also to the project storage, uh, which uh, allows just to exchange the data between the different installation of our supercomputers within our center. So currently, maybe uh, our, uh, not maybe, but our users uh, really notice that actually there is an outage of Corona because the Corona is currently in the, in the general upgrade uh, from the beginning of the April. Uh, we estimated uh, a break for the four weeks. It's, uh, we, we hope actually that within the next few days uh, uh, the, the, the upgrade will be, will be finished. Uh, the goal of the upgrade is the, really just to uh, do upgrade from the CentOS uh, operating system to uh, Rocky Linux, uh, completely the changed also the, the storage backend, uh, management software, and uh, uh, what we expect as the as a, as a, as an outcome from this uh, from this upgrade, that uh, of course the new operating system, we expected a completely new system kernel libraries, uh, uh, rebuild and uh, updated uh, user applications, new Slurm uh, for the scheduling uh, of uh, of the jobs, uh, improved scratch performance stability, availability of. Uh, Libsci Blast libraries, which will increase even more uh, the performance of, of the Carolina. So it it uh, it sounds like a really good idea just to do that. So and then uh, why we decided in the midlife to do such a software upgrade, not a hardware upgrade, please. Uh, so uh, it was also mentioned that the, we are contributing to the to the e infra cloud. Uh, environment and uh, we have dedicated 22 nodes from the Carolina uh, to, to this to this cloud uh, to this uh, infra cloud. So this the cloud is based on the OpenStack uh, technology. You can uh, you can just um, access the, the cloud via the graphic user interface. You can find uh, the link there. Uh, there is also quite extensive uh, documentation on in our documentation pages. Uh, so what's uh, really nice that actually you can uh, you can uh, uh, connect from the virtual mach ma machines from this cloud uh, cloud partition uh, also the HPC node. So this way you can simply offload the uh, uh, let's say the task which needs the HPC uh, to, let's say purely HPC environment from 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 those uh, from those virtual machines which are running within the cloud. So that's uh, that's what. Uh, uh, what might be quite interesting for uh, for the cloud users. So uh, I will return back to uh, to the energy efficiency of uh, of the supercomputing facilities. Uh, uh, I think this is not uh, any uh, 
breathtaking news that uh, the prices of the energy uh, uh, grew, the <laughs> grew last years and uh, it seems that they never uh, dropped down to the original prices before 2022 and we had to somehow to adapt for the situation. Um, of course, firstly, we need to think about how to operate our supercopiers more energy efficiently, just to decrease the prices. Then, of course, the, there is another reason, because uh, uh, typically the, the uh, budget of the infrastructure is, uh, uh, is cut. Uh, it was the 25% last year, for example. And uh, in general, we uh, want to reduce the, the carbon footprint, of course. So, and uh, that's the reason why we, uh, f uh, we started to, to operate the, the Caronia cluster with the, with the configuration, just saving the, the, the energy in a higher energy efficiency from the uh, February 2023. So let me just explain what we, what we, uh, what we did. So if you look at the non-accelerated node uh, of the Carolinas, uh, there is the AMD 7H12 uh, uh, 12 processor. And if you look at the performance just running in the, in the default frequency, uh, it means the 3.3 uh, gigahertz, you can see uh, the profile uh, depending on the, on the arithmetic intensity. The x-axis uh, shows uh, the arithmetic intensity me measures in the flops per byte. And uh, you can see that uh, the maximum is reached somewhere about 18, 20 uh, flops per byte. Uh, just capping the frequencies for, uh, for the 2,100 megahertz, uh, we can get, let's say, 80.5% of the performance from uh, from the CPU, but it has a really quite a huge impact on the on the on the power consumption. Because if you look at the same graph, or not the same, there is a different uh, different uh, uh, informations there. But there is the same x-axis, and you can see uh, uh, depending on the different arithmetic intensity how much power the processor processor needs. And you can see here that, for example, from the, from the arithmetic intensity just running the, the, the CPU uh, with the maximum of the 2.1 two, uh, gigahertz, we can save even 90, uh, uh, 90 watts at the processor, what means the approximately one third of the energy. So that's, that, this is the idea. But in fact, we are losing just only 20% of the performance and only only in a really high arithmetic intensity. And there is a question, so how many people use this so high, uh, so high arithmetic intensity? And this is the, the answer. If you look at the graph, uh, at the graph, you can see there again the arithmetic intensity, and you can see that, for example, 80% uh, of our jobs are just under the 10 flops per byte of the arithmetic intensity. So it means that, in fact, that the 20% uh, the, the of the really, what we can call as a high arithmetic intensity is used just only by the 20% of our users of our job. So from this point of view, uh, for 80%, the change we proposed will not take any effect and they will not observe simply anything. Of course, for those 20%, <laughs> who are using really higher uh, arithmetic uh, intensity, then of course uh, it, they might be affected, but it depends and we try to some, somehow to contact them and solve the situation, whether it's possible just to, how to solve their situation and so on. So this is, this is the idea, what we did. And there is also on the graph very important information, because if you look, uh, the graph uh, with, the, with the solid line shows, uh, let's say the maximal, uh, or kept uh, uh, performance uh, in case of the use of the AVX2 uh, instruction set. Uh, this is very important because if you are using the old instru uh, uh, instruction set SSE, then of course you are dropping down to 43% even operating uh, in the default frequency and 
even to 27.5%. So it means that it's really important and we warn all our users that they have to update libraries, BLAS libraries and so on just to really use AVX2 instructions because otherwise uh, they will drop down really uh, dramatically with the performance of their, of their codes. So, the same is valid, in fact, for the NVIDIA A100. We have the 576 NVIDIA A100 cards, which delivers the, uh, the bigger portion of our, the biggest portion of, uh, of, the, of the Carolina uh, supercomputer. And if you look, uh, if you look at, this, uh, at this performance graph, you can see that there is, a, just using the capping for, there is a, sorry, there is a, a typo in, uh, uh, in the legend of the graph that there should be 1,290 megahertz. If we, if we use such a frequency capping, then we are uh, losing some 10% approximately of the performance only. But again, there is a space for the, for the saving of the energy, which can reach even 110 watts on one GPU. And we have the eight GPUs per one node. So that you can imagine that this is really significant saving within the one node, so approximately one, uh, 25 percent or something like that. So, uh, what was the result? So, uh, good for the funding ag agencies, not so good for the users. The utilization increased, of course, because the running time prolonged a little bit. Uh, by, in the case of the CPU partitions, plus 50.7 percent, but we saved, without the cooling, please, just only the consumption of the, of the processors, we saved approximately 20 percent 20 of the energy. And in the case of the GPU, then again the utilization a little bit, uh, little bit increased, plus 15 percent, and the system uh, uh, average power dropped down uh, not so much significantly because, because, of course, the users are really using in the uh, GPU for the arithmetically intensive tasks. But this is, this is something what we, what we expected. So, but anyway, so, uh, in fact, if I, uh, if I, if I count this, um, let's say, the, the, the saving in the number of the nodes which we need to switch off, then it, it, uh, it's equivalent, uh, in the case of the CPU, just switching off 220 fully utilized nodes, for example, as a 31%. So this is really significant improvement in the case of the, of the non-accelerated partition. But in the case of the ac accelerated partitions, it's not so significant. However, it's still something about the 1 million check rounds we, uh, we can save this way. So, okay, this is uh, something what uh, we hope uh, didn't affect uh, so much our users, but helped us really operate uh, more efficiently our infrastructure and save the money, uh, for example, for our, uh, for our service like a support and so on. So, in parallel with our production system, Carolina and Barbara, we are also uh, operating the complementary systems. The complementary systems should provide uh, some really specific architecture technologies which are not so obvious and which uh, our users cannot uh, simply access in any other supercomputing center within the Europe. The typically, for example, you can see here, this is the Fujitsu ARM uh, A64FX, uh, which is typical for Fugaku supercomputer. It was also mentioned here. Uh, there are the FPGI cards from Intel, AMD, uh, new IBM Power 10, and we have a completely new architectures. The first one is the Intel Sapphire Rapids HBM node, so you are welcome just to, uh, just to test it. Uh, in fact, the Intel Sapphire Rapids brings a very, very high memory uh, bandwidth um, using the 128 uh, uh, gigabytes HBM2 memory. And this is the very new uh, piece of hardware we already have for the testing. This is the NVIDIA Grace Grace uh, super chip. So there are two, uh, two CPU ARM um, uh, interconnected. This is also very interesting. Uh, this is, in fact, the second most powerful CPU we already have uh, for the testing and uh, benchmarking in our center. The first one is the Intel Sapphire FA. So, please, you are welcome. Just uh, everyone who has a project uh, within our center can also apply for, uh, for these resources. Um, 
So, Lumi, uh, it was at the morning uh, presentation of Per Esther, it was mentioned that uh, uh, Lumi is the, uh, the first uh, uh, powerful supercomputer in the, in, in the Europe, number five in the world, and it's also worth to mention the number seven in the green 500, so it, it means the seventh energy efficient uh, supercomputing in the world. Uh, provides approximately 380 petaflops in, uh, in LINPEC. Uh, the consortium is built from the countries you can see uh, uh, on the picture uh, with the blue color. Uh, as you can see, the Czech Republic is the member of the consortium, and this, uh, uh, this allows us just to provide uh, approximately 2.5% of the resources to our Czech users. And we are providing in Gavaya the standard um, access, uh, open access policies I already described. So uh, at the same time as you are asking for the, for the, uh, for the, um, Carolina, you can ask also for the, for the, for the Lumi. You can see here that while this is the, 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 the chart showing the last three open calls and speci special calls, we are opening regularly. Uh, you can see that the, while the CPU part of the Lumi is already uh, quite well used, then we still have uh, some uh, available resources in the case of the, of the GPU accelerated, uh, accelerated nodes of the Lumi. Please. Don't hesitate, apply, and specifically, for example, uh, the AI community, can, uh, AI community can use the PyTorch, for example, which is uh, now very, very efficient uh, also on the Lumi. And uh, I would like to, uh, let's say, to inform you that uh, tomorrow at the morning, Lukas Spreadinger from CST will, uh, will deliver a talk about the PyTorch on the Lumi, on the Lumi G, tomorrow 9.30, I think. Okay, we are also uh, providing the services for easy access of our uh, supercomputing facility. The first one is the HIPI middleware, which is the, in fact our HPC as a service uh, application. It's uh, quite a nice tool. How to run uh, with, uh, the application of our supercomputers is uh, it's quite easy to integrate it into your codes or web pages or whatever. Uh, so this is the, also some service we are, uh, we are providing. And uh, I would like to also to, to mention here the Lexis 2 platform. The Lexis is the, the platform which allows, uh, again, for example, from your web browser just to, de uh, just to define the computing workflows and run them on the different resources from the cloud, uh, uh, cloud resources, uh, our supercomputer or any other uh, supercomputer which, uh, uh, which we have uh, agreed on the access and also link the data, uh, data connectivity and so on. And, very, uh, and as a very, very new thing, we have also implemented that Lexis 2 also allows to to, let's say, to include it or also to run the, the containers within those workflows so that you can simply run the workflow. So I, I would like to just to mention here that tomorrow, Martin Golasowski afternoon, have the presentation about the HIP and the, and the Lexis. So then, and of course, you can find the information on portal.lexis.tech. Okay, what we plan to op operate, the first of all, it was already mentioned here, this is LumiQ quantum computer. I will not talk about the consortium, which is a uh, uh, quite nice picture. I, I could spend a quite long time about the, uh, about the consortium. Uh, however, I would like to specify the LumiQ quantum computer. Uh, the, uh, the requirements, uh, requirements for this quantum computer is the superconductive technology uh, and the star shape qubit topology. So this is the very specific topology which allows to, to run uh, quite complex, uh, uh, complex algorithms um, which, uh, which reduce the number of swaps and reducing the, 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 the noise uh, in, the, in the result. So that's uh, something what, uh, what is uh, quite interesting. Uh, currently, there is an evaluation of the bits. The, the, the procurement is driven by the EuroHPC JU, but we are the part of this. Uh, and uh, we hope the installation uh, will be done in the Q4 2024 or early uh, 
2025, maybe even earlier. It depends on the result of the, of the selection. Then we plan in 2025 to, uh, uh, to install Q1, the small cluster. We are focusing uh, definitely on, the, on uh, those users which are uh, running their jobs uh, on the lower arithmetic intensity. Uh, so uh, then we plan to have uh, something that will deliver uh, the high memory throughput, like uh, Intel Granite Rapid CPU, AMD Turin CPU, or an NVIDIA Gray Superchip I already, I already described. So this is, this is the plan. You can see there are some details. Another plan is the big cluster three. And uh, that's really right now, that's end of the 2026, which is uh, something what we don't know what will be available and, and so on. So that this is something, this is that just uh, preliminary thoughts about the configuration. But still we have uh, uh, three potential architectures, x86 again, maybe Intel, ARM architecture, or the combined architecture we, we know, for example, from NVIDIA, like a Grace, Grace Hopper. Yeah, so those are uh, potential candidates, but of course it's a 2026 and, uh, you know, technology will develop dur during the time and then, of course, we will specify it a little bit more. There is also very important uh, information about the uh, modernization of the data room infrastructure uh, because of the installation of the of the new systems and parallel running of the two big cluster, we have to really increase the capacity of our, our data room, specifically in terms of the cooling uh, capacity. We need to increase the cold water secrets uh, from 1.2 uh, uh, to 1.8 megawatts, what means that we have to really, uh, really completely uh, replace the, all the chillers on, uh, on the, uh, our roof which is not so easy task because, of course, uh, they need, uh, let's say, more area, they need, uh, uh, you know, you know the, the, the weight will be uh, even higher than the previous ones, et cetera, et cetera. So this, uh, this is quite challenging. And the warm water secrets we would like to increase from, from 1.4 megawatts to 2.1. So this allows us really to, let's say, to accommodate all our plants we have in our data room. Without this uh, modernization, it will be very difficult, and uh, uh, at least we, will, we won't be able to run the, such a big systems uh, uh, at the same time within our room. So, and this is my last information. So, uh, we would like to, let's say, to continue in our training activities, and this is the numbers from the last year. You can see that we, uh, we organize about the 33 uh, training events uh, with the almost 900 uh, participants. And what's quite interesting, I think that the 50% are coming from abroad. So that, that's uh, really, uh, really a uh, uh, very interesting number. And about the 15% are coming from the, from the industry and uh, and let's say the public public sector. And now you can see also in the graph and the development of the of the structure of our events that there are increasing number of the of the training events in the quantum computing, high performance data analytics, and definitely in the artificial intelligence. And this is my last slide. This is the plan for the next year. You can see it on the events.it4i.cz. And you can see there that for the, for the rest of the year, we have at least the four, uh, uh, four training events about, uh, about the quantum computing. And you can see there also, uh, also other like a GPU with CUDA and whatever. So that's, uh, that's uh, all from my side. I hope I uh, give you a good overview about what happened in the last year and what we plan for the, for the next, not only 2024, but also 25 and 26. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, please, do we have some question? In, in Okay, I have a two simple questions. The first one, who recommended uh, decreasing the frequency of the producer or it was that from your staff? We, 
Uh, we have acquired, uh, uh, I would say, good research team which are dealing with the energy efficiency and they are uh, regularly uh, monitoring our system. So when we started just to analyze um, much more in details what, are, what is really happening on our system, needs of our users, and actually from this point of view, it's, it's well known that actually just decreasing the, the frequency uh, leads to, let's say, uh, more energy efficiency. But the good question was how much and was the right, uh, was the right, uh, let's say, the level of the, of the frequency to, 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 to operate our system. So th this was done by our research team. Okay, thank you very much. And the second question is, you are talking very often about the collaboration with industry. So you are institute of academic institutions, how it's yep. done, on which basis done. So they are paying for that uh, services or how is it done? In fact, we have uh, three types of the, of the collaboration. Uh, the first one is the, really the commercial service, just the renting the computing time. They are simply uh, paying um, completely full cost of, uh, of, uh, for the market prices. Uh, but this is something what we need to prefer and it's not, not, not very high number, typically it's something like a two person or something like that. But then of course we have the collaborative, uh, col um, uh, sorry, um, contractual research we do with, uh, with, the, with industrial partners and as a European Digital Innovation Hub uh, within the HPC and also as the National uh, Competence Centre, uh, and we have also other like uh, technological agency of the Czech Republic or Horizon Europe projects or the Digital Europe project. Within, the, within the, those projects, we have the partners from industry and we work on the research, uh, on the research goals together with them. So it's in fact the publicly funded uh, collaborative research. So those are those three typical collaborations with industry. Uh, renting of the computing time is probably not collaboration, but it's... Erwin, uh, Laura, in the morning presentation mentioned that there will be some need for refactoring of the code to run the HPC systems to lower the uh, consumption for energy and for efficiency. Do you have a capacity for application support? Uh, like helping users with the code and... Yeah, yeah. So uh, there is, a, I, I mentioned it at, the, at the, one of the first slides that we have also user support on the application level. Uh, this is currently we have as a, as a uh, funded from the Euro HPC and, and from the national resources at least two projects. The first one is the POP3, which is for the optimization of the code. And the second one is Epicure, which is the, 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 the project to just to support the users uh, just to, uh, let's say, uh, on the application level to, to, to provide the support for the more efficient use of the, of the EuroHPC systems. So those are at least two, those two, uh, let's say, uh, actions which can help us just to support our users. It's not so easy because, of course, uh, we have to and, and the first step just to focus on the really uh, big users, which are consuming the most of, the, of, our, uh, okay. of our resources, because the effect there is uh, much more higher than just the small ones, yeah, of, course, sure. yeah. of course. Yeah, but uh, because it's simply impossible just for our team. Definitely, if any one of you wants to just to work with us, so we are open, we have uh, <laughs> funding for that, but of course uh, it needs also the people who understand uh, the, the HPC uh, codes and so on, this is something what... The presentation about the energy efficiency was um, interesting, but uh, yeah. I was uh, referring to Evren uh, and yeah. his morning presentation, whether you are, you, yeah. you are thinking about this way also. Yeah. So. Yeah, actually, our team is involved in the one of the, of the project uh, which deals with the energy efficiency on all uh, European uh, supercomputing centers. And the goal is, uh, let's say, to develop, uh, we already have uh, developed some, uh, uh, some monitoring tools and so on. And the, the goal is just to develop such a tools, just to regularly monitor the system, just to collect the, all the information okay. and just to uh, run and operate the system in much more efficient way than, than, uh, than we are operating uh, them so far. I don't, I don't mean just only, uh, uh, yeah. at IT for innovation, but in general in your HPC. Okay, uh, we are kind of getting lack of the time, so. Yeah.
just a small question again. Who is the biggest consumer of your computing center? Or uh, typically, this is the material science community. Uh, but it includes uh, just also the, the drug design and uh, not only the material computational biology as well. So that those, those are typically molecular dynamics. All those computational chemistry, those are really the, let's say... No, no high energy fission. Okay. No high energy fission. But uh, I would say that also the, the AI community is increasing. Okay. Significantly. So... Thank you very much. Um, yeah, well. So now is the time for a coffee break. Uh, we have uh, some more. Uh, we are a little bit late, so we will meet again at 45, please. <laughs>